Last Sunday, somebody brought one of their grandchildren to the church, and on the way out, uh, the grandparents said some interesting things. Said, my grandson said, you have some really crazy preachers in your church. And uh, so we asked why, and he said, because they don't shout all the time. And they're actually funny <laughs> on occasions. Let me tell you, it's a, it's a terrible thing to try to be funny, but it's the worst thing to feel that you have to be somebody else when you are a disciple or when you're a preacher. You don't have to preach like anybody else. I actually think that what preaching is is communication between hearts, one heart opening itself to another. With that in mind, here we go. His name was Bonnie. He was a member of our church down on the coast. On the Thursday, we took some of the teams by the other little church that I had served before I came here, and they said, oh, that's where you are. Bonnie was real big in that church, and from time to time, he would take us out for a meal at a very high-class restaurant. The name of the restaurant was The Dog House, and we had breakfast there. It was a great breakfast for $1.50. And he and I would have conversations at the table from time to time, and he said, Brother Keith, don't ever forget that the bottom line of the church is salvation. He said, sometimes we get mixed up in so many things, we overlook the central reality of who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be about. He said, you should never get to the place that you're apologetic about talking about salvation. And he's absolutely right. Salvation is interesting. When you think of IEDs, you think of those terrible instruments of destruction that have taken the lives of so many of our Fine young men and older people, too. Salvation has an I-E-J component, and I'd like to talk about that with you for just a few minutes this morning. And the first part of that is invitation. Have you ever wanted an invitation to a certain place or to a certain group or to a certain experience a whole lot? I don't suppose any of us haven't been there in one way or the other. It would be different for each one of us, but to be a part to be a part of something that at least somebody considers important. In my younger years, I wanted to be a member of the Bay Waveland Yacht Club. Uh, we passed the remains of it uh, yesterday as we were doing a little trip down the beach and our team was working. Um, that was so very important to me, but the chances of my getting to be a member of the Bay Waveland Yacht Club were very slim indeed. As a matter of fact, it never happened. Oh, I had a chance to do one thing, for example, become the president of the Junior Commodores, because that was only because a friend of mine nominated me and there wasn't anybody else that would take it. <laughs> but I never was a member. And then there was this ball, Les Collier. It was one of the great balls of the year. And if you got an invitation to Les Collier, you were strictly uptown, trust me. The guys all wear tuxes and the girls all wear evening gowns and you sit up in this call-out place and if you're really lucky, one of the members of Les Collier, it's a girls organization, will call you down to dance. And that's a big deal. And I got to dance the first, second, third, fourth, and every single dance in the entire thing. You know why? I went to Les Collier with the president of Les Collier because a boyfriend was sick and he trusted me. <laughs> and I don't think that's a compliment. But anyway, <laughs> invitations are really interesting. And I think uh, years ago of... Right across the street from the Peachtree Road Methodist Church is a, a very famous Presbyterian church, Westminster. You know who preached there? Peter Marshall. And when I was doing a series down there, I had some time in the afternoon and went across the street. And I said, does anybody here remember Peter Marshall? And they said, his secretary, she's 80-something years old. She still works on Thursdays. And this was Thursday. And you might want to talk to her. And I went back. And the long and the short was, she said, would you like to hear him preach? And uh, I said, what do you mean? She said, oh, we have some recordings. Well, he died in 48, and I said, I, I didn't know there were any recordings. She said, there are wire recordings, uh, but we have some. And uh, she said, you want to hear one? I said, yeah. She said, what do you want to hear? I said, well, just pick out one. And so she did, and it was entitled By Invitation of Jesus. And it was based on Luke 9, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And this is just a little taste of Peter Marshall. The Lord Jesus, you know, stands at the door of your heart right now. There he stands. Can't you see him? And he's knocking at the door of your heart and he's saying, um, won't you let me come in? I won't come in if you don't want me. I won't come in with you won't, if you don't let me, but I, I, I'd love to come in. Won't you open the door of your heart? Won't you let me come in? Oh, come on. 
open up and let me come in. Shoot, I wanted to get into the tape recording machine, you know. <laughs> but isn't it interesting that you and I have received an extended invitation from the Lord of life? An extended invitation from the King of Kings, an extended invitation from Jesus of Nazareth, which is even more important to me than all the rest of it. Uh, For the one who is the Savior of our souls, saying to you, I want you to come. I want you to come to the one place, to the one party, to the one experience that is worth more than all the rest put together. You have a personal invitation, and I want you to know it. That's good news. Now, the second thing is salvation is not just an invitation, but it's also an event. It's something that happens in you and happens in me, too, and it doesn't have to be the same thing in everybody. See, that's the problem with we preacher types. So many times we create the impression that if someone is to have a salvation experience, then it has to be according to a certain set thing. We've talked about it before, but I'll say it again here. Uh, There are people who think you can't be saved if you're not singing just as I am. I mean, there are really people who believe that, you know. And I was in this little Baptist church out in Colorado. And uh, they were singing. It could have been anybody's church. And this boy came down to give his life to Jesus. And at, after it was out, after the service was out, this little boy said, didn't you go down and give your life to Jesus last night? And the little boy said, yeah. And he said, why did you go two nights in a row? And he said, because this is one of them preachers that sings one more verse until somebody comes. And he said, I'm, I'm going to get it done, you know. But the fact is that salvation comes in lots of packages, and a lot of you have heard that story, but it's a good one, and it needs to be repeated. And the other thing is that um, salvation, my mom, for example, it's her birthday. She would have been 93 years old today. She had 90 good years. The last few years were tough. Um, I say that to you because a lot of you are going through uh, later years with people that you love, and things are not always easy. Um, but, you know, they're tough for them, too, not just tough for us. But my mom had no religious experience. She had a dreadful home life. Incidentally, I heard a wonderful one this last week. Uh, maybe you all know about this. Um, one is just wonderful. Uh, you know what a dysfunctional family is? A family with more than one person. <laughs> I can tell the healthy people they're sticking their tongue out at me. But anyway... Um, Mom had a really tough family. My mom's early remembrances of her father, my, her stepdaddy, my grandfather, the one from, 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 for whom I'm named, uh, was him helping her get out from under the shiffer row where she would hide from her mother's wrath. Um, so, you know, some people have tough times of it and all that. So her mother was very religious, and so Mama decided she wasn't going to be religious at all. If that's what religion was, she wasn't interested. And so later in life, she went to a psychiatrist. She had a real bad time. Um, and the psychiatrist said a curious thing. You don't need me. You need God. He said, Louise, you need God. Isn't that interesting? And so she began a faith pilgrimage and finally found it. And she was telling me about it one day. And she said, I don't know if I'm actually saved. And I said, why is that, Mom? And she said, because it's just not like anybody else's. And I said, well, what's it like? And she said, well, it's kind of like standing out there on the beach. This is at Bay St. Louis now. Some of us have been down there can really identify with this. And those of you that haven't, you're standing out in here and looking out over this water across the seawall. She said, it's like standing on the beach and it's midnight and it's pitch black. And you stand all night long and the morning begins to come and you see one little teeny piece of light. And then you begin to see a little bit more light. And then all of a sudden you begin to say daylight. And the daylight surrounds you and you receive the light. And she said, that was my, what my salvation was about. Is that good enough? And I said, of course it's good enough. You see, because God speaks to persons in the context of their personality. See, so often we preachers try to force another dimension of understanding on people's personalities, and it never has worked. Or here's another one. There was a guy that we used to run with that we liked a lot. We had a lot of fun. He was a good runner. The only thing that made me mad was he always beat me. And, of course, anybody can beat me running, but it still made me mad. And uh, he would run out in front of me. He was kind of Mr. Pretty and all that kind of stuff. And um, he was um, kind of taken with himself. And then he got saved. In fact, he got saved one day when we were running at the YMCA. I'll never figure this one out because I thought we preachers had to make that happen. But he was just running around the track, and all of a sudden he said, Hallelujah. And I said, well, what happened to you? He said, Jesus just came into my heart. I said, that's wonderful. And you know what? I could not stand him for two years. (laughs) 
I mean, he'd point his finger at you. He'd put you down. You know, he would say, well, if you were just really a Christian, you really understood these things. And he finally grew up a little bit. Let's cut a little slack for these people that are new to the faith. But see, that's another way. And all too often, listen, all too often, the only kind of presentation we offer people is the real dramatic one. And I think it's great if you have a real dramatic one. But I don't think it's the only way. I think it's just one. Now, watch me because I'm going to get with it. There are some of you in this place that have a hard time singing nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, for some reason or the other, those kinds of things do not bring good, uh, positive connotation to you. Uh, I happen to love to sing that song because I understand that salvation always requires personal interpretation. Personal interpretation of reality. When I sing nothing but the blood of Jesus, I do not apologize for one moment for the Jesus who said, I'm willing to give you everything I've got, including me. You want my blood? Take my blood. Somehow or the other, that moves me. But I, all I have to do is sing nothing but the life of Jesus because blood and life are the same thing. And so be vigorous and be bold and interpret it. Salvation comes in numerous packages. Let me tell you another one. Um, it's quite different from, some other, for, from, from other, other ones, but Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa would tell you she never had one of those moments. She would never had one of those places where she felt, oh, God loves me, I'm redeemed. Uh, it's all one. She said, I just began to go out and help people, and I looked in the face, faces of these people, and at first I saw agony, and then I saw pain, and then one day I saw Jesus. And she said, I couldn't look in any face of any person of any kind without seeing Jesus. Listen to me. If that's not salvation, then I don't know what is. See? So don't feel like you've got to be like someone else, but do allow God to bless you in God's way according to the person that you are and the life experience that you have had. One more thing. Salvation is also a journey. You know, you must be born again. That's when you begin to see and understand that you're in the kingdom party, that you're a part of the family of God. But beginning, being born again is only beginning. We talk about that very often around here, but you need to go on. You need to go on to perfection. And I was sharing with the early service something that happened when I was getting ordained. And some of you have heard this uh, more than twice, but I love to tell it. When I was going to be ordained, they asked me a bunch of questions, one of which was, will you abstain from the use of tobacco and be moderate and all other things? Remember that? And what I said, does that mean a little wine, a little whiskey, a little women? And they said, well, of course not. You know, sometimes they're naive in those ordination groups. But uh, anyway... I mean, I guess it's because they're so pure. But anyway, um, but there was a guy that stood in there. Oh, there was another question they asked. Will you abstain from the use of tobacco? Did I say that? And be moderate and all that? Yeah, I did. Okay, anyway, this guy is standing next to me. Oh, the next question is, and will you go on to perfection? Well, I, cannot, I could not answer that without laughing, you know. But I I'm, I'm promise you, I saw people say yes without even cracking a smile. <laughs> will you go on to perfection? Yes. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe. Um, but anyway, so this guy's standing next to me, and he's well known for his honesty. And they, Will you abstain from the use of tobacco and be moderate all other things? I can't honestly promise that. <laughs> and all the rest of us, I will God being my helper. I mean, he got it down. It was, it was perfect, you know. Uh, will you go on to perfection? He said, I think that's silly. <laughs> I don't think he understood it. Let me tell you what it means. If you start being a Christian, are you willing to keep on trying? If you begin... Will you continue? If you think that salvation is an event, then will you allow salvation to become a journey? Will you allow it to become your life? Will, allow it, will you allow it to become your joy? Will it, you allow it to become the way you relate to people? Because salvation is always this. Let me show it to you, even if you don't want to hear it. Watch it. It's this and that and this. God and neighbor and self and I don't care how saved you say you are, if you don't have a new and better view of God, and if you don't have an honest compassion and love, or at least want to have an honest and compassion love from your neighbor, and if you don't have a new sense of the value and dignity of yourself, then you haven't quite got there yet, but God wants you to. It's a journey, and it's a journey that begins, and it's a journey that continues. Um, I loved all of the music today, and incidentally, sure, come early and fill the church up tonight for the choir. Um, but it's great to have Debbie on the flute. And when Margaret plays the cello, I, it's, just, it's something that adds to all of us. But did you ever think about what a flute is? It's a salvation experience. What you do is you take breath and you direct breath with your own manipulations. 
The word for Holy Spirit is the same word as breath. Breathe on me, breath of God. Salvation is the breathing on of the breath of God onto your heart, onto your soul. And then the journey is manipulating the breath to create the sounds and the music of salvation. You can do that. Many of you are already doing that. And some of you are saying, I never had a lot of space in my life for religion, but maybe it really is a whole lot more than I ever thought about before. And maybe I can also make music. I cannot tell you what happens to us. I'm through except this postscript, and then we'll have communion back there. Chris will come and get it and take it for those of you who want to have communion right back there in the little alcove. Can I tell you what it means to give communion to you guys and gals? I mean, your coming and your receiving is a holy thing. Uh, this morning, Todd and Brad had to leave to go get ready for the bake sale and all, and so Darian um, Duckworth, who is a clergy woman, I was sitting over there, and I asked her to come up there, and she said, Keith, this is absolutely awesome. And every one of us that do it know it's awesome. It, it's, it's, it's godsome. So anyway, uh, I was doing it at that time. Somebody said, why do you always do that end and give people this end? Because I fit on that end better than on this end, see? <laughs> and uh, got to come through that little slow passage. But anyway, I was doing communion on that end uh, one time. Listen to it. Stay with me on this, and we'll be done. I'm giving communion. This girl says, stop. So I stopped. Oh, this girl's a young woman. She said, do you read Thomas Wolfe? <laughs> I'm giving communion, you know? <laughs> and I said, well, a little. She said, do you know about You Can't Come Home Again, that book? I said, yes, I know about that book. She said, it's wrong. I said, why? And she said, because, Keith, I just came home. It comes in a lot of ways. It comes in a lot of styles, but it's God's gift for you. And so maybe old Peter is right when he says, will you come in? Will you let me come in? Oh, come on. Let's pray. God's salvation as invitation, as event, and as continuing journey. The journey is taking the salvation and living it out there instead of just inside us. Help us, even though we're fragile and even though we don't always do all things well, to at least do some of it in a different way because of who you have become to us and what the Spirit of Jesus means to our life and to our days. Hear our prayer, O Lord, in his name. Amen. The closing song is number 348.